you very much. Um, firstly, can I just say uh, thank you. Um, thank you to all of you for your patience. Not only did you have to get up early, but um, I've kept you waiting all this time. Um, and, and thank you to the organisers and especially Cliff for, for being um, so extraordinarily understanding with, with my constraints and bending over backwards to put this at some, some weird time slot. Um, so I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think is an extremely basic question about quantum field theory. Um, and uh, it's a question which is, is the following. If you have a bunch of massless fermions, uh, then it's a true fact that massless fermions always have more symmetries than massive fermions. And the question is a very basic one. It's that if you take a bunch of massless fermions and you give them a mass, uh, what symmetries do you break? And more said conversely, what symmetries could you possibly hope to keep when giving fermions uh, a mass? So everything I'm going to tell you about is, is based really on this first paper that, that's now a year old with, um, with Shlomo. Uh, but then there was a, a follow-up paper earlier this this year with with many many uh examples and as i mentioned already just just jump in and ask questions um at, at any stage so um as i said this is the um the, the question we're going to, to ask um massless fermions have more symmetries than massive fermions that that's uh, obvious in even dimensions because a, a a massless dirac fermion decomposes into two vial fermions and you can rotate independently the phases of those two vial fermions uh, in odd space-time dimensions. It, it's usually to do with time reversal or, or some discrete symmetry like this, which uh, a massless fermion has, but a massive fermion does not. And just to set, set the scene, tell you something very basic, um, in four dimensions, if you give a mass to a Dirac fermion, um, then you can no longer rotate the phase of both of those vials independently. Um, the, the chiral or axial symmetry under which left and right-handed fermions transform differently is broken by the mass term, um, while the vector symmetry under which left and right transform the same is, is, is preserved. And uh, this, this intuition uh, that comes just from writing down quadratic mass terms might lead you to think that this is always the case, that if you give masses to fermions, it's vector-like symmetries that are necessarily preserved because the mass terms always come by pairing up left and right-handed uh, fermions in, in this way. And um, the, the punchline of the talk is, is that that's not the case, is, is that things are a little more subtle. And when you allow for strong coupling effects in quantum field theory, um, there are other more novel ways to give masses to fermions that aren't just writing down quadratic terms in the Lagrangian um, uh, that can preserve some different symmetries. So that, that's gonna be the story that I tell uh, over this talk. All right, so, so what is the, the real issue? The, the real issue isn't, isn't new. It was flagged up by um, Hittoft, how long ago, like 40 years ago, long, long, uh, a long time ago. Uh, Hittoft pointed out that there is an obstacle towards preserving a symmetry when you give fermions a mass, but the obstacle is not the, the chiral nature of that symmetry, at least it's not that, that per se. It's a little more subtle than that. So, um, Toft pointed out um, the importance of what we now call the Toft anomaly. So let me just remind you what this is. Uh, take a quantum field theory, and the quantum field theory has a global symmetry that I'm going to call G. And for this discussion, it's important that it's a global symmetry. Now, um, associated to that global symmetry, uh, and it's easiest just to think of it as a continuous symmetry for now in four dimensions, associated to that global symmetry, um, you can attach a number. And that number is called the Toft anomaly. And the way you calculate this number is uh, through these familiar uh, triangle-like diagrams, or you can do Fujikawa path integral techniques. Um, but basically you sum over all vial fermions running in a loop, where on the three edges, you put currents for the global symmetry. Now, I, I should just try and clear up any, any confusion uh, that may be here. When we first learn about anomalies, it's not this anomaly that we learn about. When we first learn about anomalies, we have one global current and two gauge currents. Uh, and at least I think in some of my lecture notes, when I first introduced anomalies, I said that it's a, it's a symmetry of the classical theory that does not survive quantization. That, that's not a great characterization of, of anomalies in general, and it's not what's happening here. If, if a symmetry has a Toft anomaly, there's nothing wrong with that symmetry in the quantum theory. There's a conservation law associated to it. If it's a non-abelian symmetry, everything falls into nice uh, um, uh, multiplex representations of the symmetry. Um, but what it is, is it's a, it's a way to characterize the symmetry. And uh, it's important for the following reason. 
that you take a quantum field theory, typically in four dimensions, we can calculate in the ultraviolet, but things become complicated and strongly coupled in the infrared. There's the Toft anomaly associated to a symmetry. And whatever you do to that theory, deform it in some way, let it flow under RG, if the symmetry survives, uh, this number, this Toft anomaly, um, remains unchanged. So it's a way to characterize uh, any global symmetry of, uh, of a quantum field theory, and in particular is invariant under RG. That's why it's, it, it's important. So, um, you know, it, it's really, quantum field theory is hard. I think we all know quantum field theory is hard. The, the nice thing about this is it's dead easy. I and mean, it, it's dead easy to calculate the Toft anomaly for a symmetry, um, but it's remarkably powerful. So in particular, if you have a four dimensional theory with a continuous symmetry, and you calculate in the UV the Toft anomaly for this, uh, and it's non-zero, you can immediately say that that theory must have massless particles in the infrared. It's, it's an astonishingly strong statement. Um, and the argument goes as follows. This is Toft's original argument. Um, let's pretend the converse is, is true. Suppose that in the infrared, the symmetry G was unbroken, and there was no massless uh, particles at all. Well, then there'd be nothing to saturate the Toft anomaly in the infrared. If you calculated the Toft anomaly below the mass gap, uh, it would give zero, which is different from what you calculated above. But this Toft anomaly is an RG invariant, so that can't be the case. So what it means is if the Toft anomaly is non-zero, um, uh, either the symmetry is broken, in which case there are massless Goldstone modes, or the symmetry is unbroken, in which case there are necessarily massless fermions in the infrared, which must saturate the anomaly uh, at, at very low energies. And, and if there are experts around, there, there are other symmetries where you can actually saturate this anomaly uh, with a topological quantum field theory. That's not possible in four dimensions with, with continuous symmetries. So that, that's not um, an option here. All right, um, so this is uh, the idea of the, of the Toft anomaly. It's important because it gives you very powerful information about the quantum field theory. And for the purposes of this talk, I want to point out that the Toft anomaly should be viewed as an obstruction. In fact, it's an obstruction in two independent ways. Um, firstly, if the Toft anomaly is non-zero, then it's an obstruction to gauging the symmetry. You can't uh, couple this global current to a gauge field in a consistent fashion, because if you tried to, this, this Toft anomaly would be promoted to a gauge anomaly, and theories with gauge anomalies are a sick theory, they, they don't make sense as quantum field theories. So a, a Toft anomaly means you can't uh, gauge the global symmetry. But in addition, it also is an obstruction to giving masses to fermions, preserving the symmetry. Because of what I just said, that, that this Toft anomaly is invariant under RG. So if you have a global symmetry whose Toft anomaly is, is non-vanishing, it, it's just game over. There's no possible way that you could give masses to those fermions preserving that symmetry G. And indeed, if I go back a slide, that, that's what happens here. If you calculate the Toft anomaly for the axial symmetry for a single Dirac fermion, it's non-vanishing. It means any way that you give a mass to a single Dirac fermion, you're always going to break that, that axial symmetry. You don't have an option. However, um, it leaves open the following possibility, which is, um, what if the Toft anomaly is not vanishing? Now, um, sorry, I said it wrong. <laughs> what if the Toft anomaly is vanishing? So uh, one way for Toft anomalies to vanish is you have a vector-like theory. Uh, and as we've already seen, uh, sorry, a vector-like symmetry, one that acts the same on left and right-handed fermions. As we've already seen, uh, it's very easy to preserve vector symmetries when giving fermions a mass. But, um, there may be other situations in which the Toft anomaly vanishes for more subtle reasons. Maybe there's some delicate balancing between left and right-handed fermions. So you have a chiral symmetry that acts differently on left and right-handed fermions, uh, but one with a vanishing Toft anomaly. And in that case, there's no obstruction to gauging, but the, the argument says there should be no obstruction to giving masses to those fermions either. Uh, the problem is that you can't just write down mass terms because they necessarily break uh, any chiral symmetry that acts differently on left and right-handed fermions. So here's, here's an example, and it's, you know, it's literally the most famous example in, in all of physics. Um, uh, consider the following symmetry group, SU3 times SU2 times U1 with 15 fermions that we call quarks and leptons that carry the quantum numbers that you all know and love under, under this symmetry. Um, 
when we first learn the, the standard model, it's, it's really one of the nicest calculations we ever do as, uh, as students. You show that all the anomalies vanish uh, for, for the fermions um, in the standard model, which means that there's no obstacle towards gauging G. And of course, we know that theoretically, but we also know it experimentally because, because G is obviously gauged um, in our world. You know, as a as something of a tangent, a, a couple of years ago, my student Nakar and Lohit Siri and I uh, revisited this famous anomaly cancellation calculation in the standard model. And we showed that it's actually intimately tied to Fermat's last theorem, that, that buried within the anomaly cancellation con, uh, conditions of the standard model, if you do the right change of variables, is, is, is Fermat's last theorem. It's, uh, it's, it's, I thought it was quite a cute result. All right, so um, the anomalies vanish and there's no obstacle towards gauging G, but from the previous slide, that means there should be no obstacle towards giving all of these fermions a mass without breaking G. And the question is, how, how do you do it? In principle, there's no obstacle, but, but in practice, how, how is this possible? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but as you all know, um, that's not the route nature chose. Nature gave a mass to all quarks and leptons in the standard model, um, by coupling them to a Higgs field, the Higgs field gets a VEV, uh, it gives a mass to the quarks and leptons, but in doing so, it breaks the symmetry group G. So in our world, as far as we can tell, uh, all quarks and leptons get a mass only because G is broken. But um, on general grounds, there should be another way. There should be an entirely new mechanism that gives a mass to one generation of quarks and leptons in the standard model, but leaves the electroweak symmetry completely untouched. Uh, a way to give a mass without breaking this, this symmetry. And that, that's what I want to tell you about in this, uh, um, in this talk, H how to do it in this specific example, but also more generally how this is, uh, this is possible at all. Um, th this might be a good point to pause and ask if, if there are any questions at all. I can't resist asking, uh, is the connection to the Fermat's last theorem something which is, uh simple to state or should we wait till the end and ask you that? Oh, I could state it ra rather quickly. Um, you know, the gauge group is U1, not R. So there's a difference between those two groups. When the gauge group is R, um, the, the charges of fermions can be anything you like. I and mean, the ratio of charges can be irrational numbers. You can have one charge of one and one of root two. But when it's U1, the, 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 um, the charges should really be integer valued. Uh, which is sort of where a bit of number theory starts to creep in. Now, when you solve these anomaly equations, you want to solve them over the integers, not over the, um, over the, uh, the, the, the reals. So, so the game is the following, actually. You, you throw away um, the requirement that it's consistent with gravity. Of course, we want it to be consistent with gravity, but nonetheless, you throw that away. But in its place, you put the fact that the charges should all be integer values or rational numbers. Um, and, and then you get a, a fewer anomaly equations but when you do this co super complicated change of variables that, that my student Nakarin discovered, um, out pops the equation x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed, where x and y and z are integers. That, that's the requirement for anomaly cancellation of the standard model. And of course, you know, there, there is a solution, but it's a boring solution. It's 1 plus 0 equals 1. When you plug that in and you undo this change of variables, out pop the hypercharges for, um, for the standard model. It, it's, it's a lovely thing, Cliff. We, we wrote a, a joyous two-page paper uh, on this, which one I've ever had writing a paper. Well, you should never have written a paper on it. He should have just written on the margin of his thesis that he had a proof. <laughs> yes, he should. <laughs> can, can, I, can I ask a question, please? Yeah, please do. So in the, on the previous slide, you said that, that uh, one of the possibilities that the symmetry is spontaneously broken that generates goldstones, which are massless. But then you said something I didn't understand. You said with the goldstone, you can saturate the anomaly. But goldstones are scalars. How, how are you going to do that? Oh, you cannot... <laughs> Sorry, Antonio, if I said that, I, I, I misspoke. There's two options in the infrared if the Toft anomaly is non-vanishing. One, the symmetry is broken in which case you have Goldstone modes. Uh, and actually the, the anomaly does manifest itself in some West Samino Witten terms for those Goldstone okay, modes. Okay, but that's sort okay, of a different, okay. a different story. Two, if the symmetry is unbroken, you necessarily have massless fermions. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that, that I understood, but I thought, I don't know, maybe I'm, I, I misunderstood you said that the Goldstone would saturate the anomaly and that was, I, I didn't quite, so you mean a West Samino Witten term? No, in fact, I, di I didn't want to go down the West Samino Witten route, so I think I just misspoke. Uh, so sorry, sorry oh, okay. to confuse you, Antonio. Okay, thank you, David.
Other questions? All right, so, so th this is where we are. This is the challenge ahead of us. Um, you have a, a chiral symmetry, G, but the anomaly vanishes because there's some interesting cancellation between left and right-handed fermions. And the goal is to find a way to give a mass to all of those fermions without breaking the symmetry G. Um, I, I should say that this is a, a story which has been um, explored in, in some great detail in the condensed matter uh, context, in, in the story of interacting topological insulators. Um, they were largely interested in discrete symmetry groups G, where the, the role of anomalies was, was actually less clear and um, you know, partly it was trying to understand that. But in the context of condensed matter physics, this whole story has a name and the name is symmetric mass generation. So symmetric mass generation means giving masses to fermions that preserve a symmetry that you might naively think would be broken because it's chiral. And that's, that, that's where we're going with, with this talk. All right, so um, I'm gonna organize the talk as follows. I'm gonna give you some sort of big picture discussion of, of how this could possibly work. Um, and then I'll go and give you two very, very clean, explicit examples uh, of how to do it, where we'll flesh out some some of the details. So let me try and give you the big picture discussion. And you know, I've given this talk before and I wave my hands like crazy at this point. So I, it might be helpful to know what my waving means. Um, th this axis is going to be the energy scale as I, as I wave my hands. And um, you start, my left hands are going to be massless chiral fermions. So you start with some massless chiral fermions. Uh, there's some chiral symmetry G under which uh, uh, they're charged and you want to give them a mass without breaking G. And the question is, how, how do you do it? Um, you can't write down quadratic terms because it's chiral and quadratic terms would, would necessarily break G. And um, you might be able to write down higher um, uh, fermion terms, four fermion, six fermion. It's quite possible that there's say a four fermion term that preserves G, but crucially four fermion terms are irrelevant in, in four dimensions. Um, this is the right crowd to be talking to for that. This is an effective field theory statement. Four fermion terms are irrelevant. They can't possibly gap fermions in, in the infrared. So all the interaction terms that you can write down are irrelevant if you just have massless fermions. Um, so it's clear you need to do something new. You can't just allow the fermions to interact among themselves and, and give them a mass. So to give these fermions a mass, we're obliged to introduce some new dynamical degrees of freedom. And here's, here's the general setup. There are a bunch of rules that, that, that go with this that I'm, I'm just gonna brush under the carpet, but here's roughly speaking is, is the general setup. Uh, you start with massless fermions and you add some new degrees of freedom at some high energy scale. Uh, these new degrees of freedom may be charged under G as well, but if they are, they have to be charged in a vector-like fashion. There should be no obstacle at all to just writing down trivial mass terms for these the idea being that I can always crank that mass up and just decouple them from the setup. So I've, I've just got the massless fermions that, that I care about. So from that starting point, the goal is um, to dial the parameters of your theory and find a path in theory space, which brings these degrees of freedom down, always preserving this symmetry group G and allows these degrees of freedom to interact with the massless fermions the goal being that everything is going to become massive while G remains uh, unbroken throughout. That's the general, uh, the general setup. All of which is, is summarized in, in the, the following, um, I, I still find rather surprising equations, not quite the right, the right word, pseudo equation. You know, you think chirality of a, of a, of a theory is something which, which is absolutely God given. And the whole basis of what I'm, I'm going to tell you is, is that that's not true. You can take a chiral theory plus a vector-like theory and allow them to interact. And what comes up at the end of the day is a vector-like theory. That's sort of the rather surprising, at least for me, punchline of, um, uh, of, of this, this research. And there's, a, there's another um, punchline, which we'll see as we go along, but it, it turns out that the phenomenon of symmetric mass generation um, is very intimately tied with a phenomenon known as confinement without chiral symmetry breaking in, in quantum field theories. And I think it's best explained by looking at some examples uh, as, as I go along, why that connection is, is there, that should become clear. Um, so that, that's sort of the broad picture of, of what, what we're doing. It's not the fermions interacting with themselves, it's adding extra degrees of freedom. Those extra degrees of freedom will ultimately give them 
a mass. So let me um, let me give you some uh, examples. I'm going to give you two two examples. So here is um, the first example. I'll take G to be S U N, and I'll consider a bunch of vial fermions. Everything here is say a right-handed fermion. Uh, one fermion will transform in the symmetric of S U N, and then there'll be n plus four that transform in um, the anti-fundamental of, of S U N. Uh, this is a famous collection of vial fermions whose anomaly vanishes. In fact, if you've seen this collection of fermions before, it's almost certainly in the context where G uh, is a gauge group. It's an SUN excuse me, uh, chiral gauge theory. Uh, that's because the anomaly vanishes, so there's no obstruction towards you, you gauging G. Uh, in what follows, it doesn't matter if you think of G as a global symmetry or a gauge symmetry, the story is exactly the same, but the gauge dynamics of G are not going to play any role in, in what follows. It's sort of just a, a bystander symmetry. Okay, so that's our starting point. They're the massless fermions. And now the question is, how do we add extra degrees of freedom um, that give a mass to all of these uh, without breaking G? And you can see immediately that you can't write down quadratic terms that, that do it. It just doesn't, doesn't work. Okay, here, here's the way it works. Um, this whole story of symmetric mass generation is, is closely tied to strong coupling effects in quantum field theory. It's, it's not something that happens at weak coupling doesn't happen with quadratic mass terms. So somehow we need to drive to strong coupling. And in four dimensions, at least the only way to drive to strong coupling is to introduce non-abelian gauge fields. So these new degrees of freedom that ultimately are gonna be, initially are gonna be heavy, um, they have to be non-abelian gauge fields of some kind. And in this context, it's very clear um, what you should do. Uh, in addition to this symmetry group G, which you really care about and do not want to break under any circumstances, um, there's another symmetry of this theory, um, which is an SU n plus four symmetry, which just rotates these fermions among themselves. So what we're going to do uh, with two caveats is just gauge this SU n plus four symmetry. Now, um, the first thing to say is you're not allowed just to gauge it uh, because um, it has an anomaly and the anomaly doesn't vanish. Uh, the, the, if you just gauge this, um, Sorry, the bells of Trinity College are ringing in the background. And they're, they're much loud, louder than I would have hoped. Okay, it's lucky it's not 12 o'clock, it's only, uh, only two. Um, uh, so we want to gauge this, but we want the anomaly to vanish. The way to get uh, the anomaly to vanish is you have to add an extra fermion. Uh, the extra fermion is going to be in the anti-anti-symmetric of H, where those two antis mean different things. It's really the anti-symmetric bar representation of of H, but, but crucially is uncharged under G. So it doesn't change the anomaly for, for G. Um, in addition, we want all this extra stuff to be heavy to begin with. And the way you make gauge bosons heavy, of course, is, is through a Higgs mechanism. So we're gonna add some scalars. Uh, these scalars are initially going to be condensed so that uh, this gauge group H is Higgs and everything is heavy. And this additional fermion is also gapped at the same time. And it, it's not hard to do that. So that's our setup. Original fermions and the new degrees of freedom is, is stuff that none of it's charged under G. Uh, it's an extra fermion anti-symmetric bar plus H plus some Higgs fields, which, uh, um, uh, which give everything a mass. And the anti-symmetric bar is vector-like, is it? No, so it's a vial fermion. Yeah, Every, everything, everything that has a box is a right-handed vial fermion. But I thought the rules were you only, are you only allowed to add the vector-like stuff. Vector like under G, and it's just neutral under G, so it's- Oh, under G, I'm sorry. Yeah. I see, okay. Yeah. This, this, this story I'm telling is um, gapping the fermions, preserving G, but H gets, uh, H pays the price. H gets broken in the, in the context. You could ask an entirely different question, which is, is, could you gap these fermions, preserving G and H? And then you have to work harder. It's, pos it's possible to do, but it's not what I'm doing here. So I'm gapping, G is the thing that's sacrosanct, cannot break under any circumstances. A H, uh, you know, I can throw away and will, will throw away. All right. Um, so so what, what's the setup? Massless fermions, extra stuff. When those scalars that I introduced are um, condensed, that extra stuff is heavy. The more they condense, the heavier it gets. But what, what do I do? I, I start to change the, the potentials for that, that scalar. Um, the condensation gets smaller. These things become lighter. 
Uh, eventually, I can just make those scalars heavy and decouple them, in which case I now have some strongly interacting quantum field theory that I have to deal with. The strong interactions, again, aren't to do with G, they're to do with this extra symmetry group H. So I now have a, a quantum field theory that I need to solve, which is uh, this gauge group coupled to these, these fermions. So let, let me introduce some names of things just to make things uh, a little easier. So what did I start with? Um, I started with the two fermions that I called lambda and psi. Uh, you see that the first element of this, uh, this bracket is the representation under G. That was what I cared about. Uh, the second entry in, in the bracket is the representation under H. And I, in addition to my first two fermions, I said that I added this, this extra guy, which G doesn't know about. What I have to do is solve the problem of uh, this gauge group H coupled to a bunch of fundamental fermions under H plus this anti-symmetric bar under H. It's a strongly coupled gauge theory. And the question is, what, what does it do? Um, the honest answer to this question is we really don't know. In, in fact, it's a little weird. We, we've had a very good guess for the last 40 years. And within the last, last two years, various people have started casting aspersions on, on this good guess. So somehow our, our knowledge has retreated when it comes to this particular question. Let me tell you what we thought happened for the last 40 years. Um, what we thought happened is, is due uh, originally to Georgi and, and then um, famous paper by Demopolis, Rabi and, and Suskind. And these people pointed out that uh, this gauge theory is an extremely good candidate for a theory that confines without breaking its global symmetry, uh, where in this case, the global symmetry of the H gauge theory is the thing that I call G. So um, there was a little bit of evidence for this, but the main evidence for this is that uh, if it happens, um, there's a very good candidate for what, what the end um, uh, the, the end result is. You see that, yeah, let, let me back up a little bit. From the perspective of H, G is a global symmetry, but the fermions that are coupled to H um, have a Toft anomaly for G. What, why is that? It's because um, the lambda and the psi together have a vanishing Toft anomaly for G. They, they were put in precisely because that anomaly vanished. But H only knows about the psi and doesn't know about the lambda. So um, uh, as far as the H gauge dynamics are concerned, G has a Toft anomaly. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, if it has a Toft anomaly, uh, either G is broken, in which case there are Goldstone bosons, or G is unbroken, in which case there has to be a massless fermion in the infrared to saturate that Toft anomaly. And uh, what these authors did is just point out that the simplest H singlet you can write down, assuming that H that this gauge group H confines uh, is the following fermion, um, which does indeed saturate the Toft anomalies of, uh, of, of G. So under this assumption, what, what happens? Uh, these two fermions here bind together through confinement, but leave a massless composite fermion in the infrared. And the nice thing about this massless composite fermion is that its quantum numbers are precisely the opposite of uh, um, of, of what we started with lambda. Lambda just wasn't playing a role in this story. In other words, if you go back to your theory and you add in the UV the following four fermion term, it's invariant under G. You think it's an irrelevant operator because it's a four fermion term, but actually it's an example of what's called a dangerously irrelevant operator. It, it's irrelevant, it looks to be irrelevant in the UV, but as you flow under RG, uh, strong coupling dynamics kick in and they change the dimension of this operator from something that's irrelevant to something that's relevant. And in this case, they change it to simply a mass term. And it's a mass term because these final three fermions bind together to become uh, a new composite fermion in the infrared. So in the infrared, this becomes a mass term which gaps the fermions G. All of which um, means the following. F firstly, this does illustrate that, that the nature of chirality is somehow a little bit fragile, that, that strong coupling quantum effects can rearrange quantum numbers, keeping Toft anomalies the same, uh, and change what you thought was a chiral theory into a vector-like theory, which is, is what happened here. The, the other thing is to say that there's a, a cute little irony in, in, in this. Um, 
For many years, pe people thought that these kind of theories were useful because they gave massless composite fermions in the infrared. That, that's sort of what model builders were, were using these kind of uh, ideas for. And here the slight twist is, is that um, if you get a massless composite fermion, it allows you to give the fermion a mass. But it allows you to give the fermion a mass in a way that preserves a symmetry that you might naively thought was broken. In other words, it allows you to achieve uh, symmetric mass generation. All right. A any questions about this? Sorry. Um, just a question. Uh, here well, you have gapped lambda, but not psi? I've gapped everything. Yeah. So, okay. so, so what happened? I started with, with um, three fermions. Th these two were involved in some strong coupling dynamics. So everything became massless, but what was left at the end was a, a massless composite for all of these. That massless composite is, is what I've called lambda tilde. Mm -hmm. Lambda tilde then subsequently interacts with lambda through this simple four, four, four fermion coupling and everything gets mass. Oh, okay. So it's lambda and lambda tilde and lambda tilde comes from psi, okay. Yeah, if I, if I didn't have this four fermion term, I'd be left with two massless fermions mm -hmm. in the infrared, lambda and lambda tilde, but they have opposite quantum numbers. In the UV, they had very different quantum numbers, chirally different. Now they just have conjugate quantum numbers. Okay, good. Thank you. Also, uh, you said that this is a 40-year-old uh, consensus, which is breaking down. Will we, we get back to that? Yeah, I'll say a few words on the next, the, the, the next okay. slide. Um, so I have a question from Pablo on, in the chat. Let me just, just uh, pass this. You started with a theory where the top number of G was vanishing. Yes. You say the anti-fundamental fermions also transform under the new gauge symmetry. Doesn't the top anomaly of G uh, change? Aren't you changing the number of degrees of freedom? I'm not sure I really understood the question, um, pa Pablo, but let, let me try and then you can come back and, and tell me what I, I, I misunderstood. Um, I am changing new degrees of freedom. I added extra stuff in the, in the far UV originally. That was this, this field, chi tilde and H, but it, none of them affected the top anomaly of G it's not charged under G, it's just a, just a symbol. However, as far as the H dynamics is concerned, it never knew about lambda, it just wasn't talking to lambda. So as far as H was concerned, the Psi on its own did have a Toft anomaly, which is why there was a massless fermion in the infrared. But the Toft anomaly for Psi had to cancel the Toft anomaly for lambda, and now you can trivially see it does because it's just the conjugate representation. It, when it was in the form of Psi, that there was a calculation you had to do. You had to figure out what these cubic Casimirs are of SUN to make sure that this exactly cancelled this. But after confinement, you just look, it's in the conjugate representation, of course it cancels. Does, does that answer the question, Pablo? So I didn't play around, I didn't mess around with the Toft anomaly for G, it was zero throughout. But the way it was, the way the zero emerged is in two different ways in the UV and the IR because uh, the representations under G are different in the UV and IR. Adding, I'm adding colors in the anti-fundamental, but for this new gauge group H, not, not for G. So the whole game is, is you start with a field theory, light stuff G plus some heavy stuff, and you need a, uh, to you could always add extra degrees of freedom, but that heavy stuff can't change the Toft anomaly for G. And you find a path in that field theory that preserves G. That, that's all, with everything becoming gapped at the end of the day. And this is, this is a path that does it. All right. It, it's, it, it's subtle. I agree that it's, uh, it's subtle, but it does what I claim on the tin. It gives a mass to chiral fermions preserving G. Let, let me answer Cliff's question. Um, so, so this confinement without chiral symmetry breaking scenario, um, I should firstly say, if that scenario is not correct, then everything I said just doesn't work. Um, that this is not a mechanism that gives masses preserving G, if that scenario is not correct. There have been a bunch of papers over the past um, year. Um, some of them are interesting, and some of them are wrong. <laughs> if you want to know which are interesting or which are wrong, like, the, let me put it this way. The paper at the end that I cite is not wrong. Um, it may not be interesting either, but it does say which of the other ones are wrong and, and which are interesting. But, but um, there's a paper by Chabachaki and, and Hitoshi Murayama, um, and I'm afraid I don't know Telem's first name, um, but uh, 
they look at another different scenario for this theory, starting with a supersymmetric theory and doing some soft Susie breaking. Um, and that clearly gives something that's consistent with the anomalies, and it has some particular symmetry breaking pattern of G um, that, that is certainly plausible. Um, so I, I, okay, I think I've told you which papers are interesting and which papers are wrong. Um, but th there's another plausible scenario on the table, Cliff, uh, for what, what this does with a particular fermion condensate breaking the global symmetry G to something else. Uh, David, do you mind if I ask you something? No, not at all. So uh, you said here that confinement with a carl symmetry breaking may be wrong, but uh, if, if I remember correctly in supersymmetry, if you use some of the cyber dualities, you can indeed have situations where you uh, confine without breaking the carl symmetry. Isn't that right? You, you, it's like I planted you in the audience, Antonio. That's, that, that's exactly <laughs> where we're going next. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, David. <laughs> sorry for the spoiler. <laughs> Not in the slightest. All right, other questions? Uh, you said this is, can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Uh, you, you said this is something that uh, is in the condensed matter uh, literature, is in condensed matter experiments as well. Can that tell you any way in which this, uh, this, this symmetry breaking scenario might work? No, so not, not these four dimensional non-abelian gauge theories. And it, you know, condensed matter physics is, is really good for 3D <laughs> field theories, but, but not, not so good for the kind of field theories that particle physicists care about. And well, in this so it's, different, it's, it's different enough that you can't get any insight. Yeah, from. in fact, in this particular con uh, context, it, it was really some discrete symmetries, some discrete Z2 symmetries on to say which left-handed fermions change, but right-handed do not. Um, that, that, that there was a paper 10 years ago by Fidkowski and Kitayev that sort of kick-started this whole field of symmetric mass generation, but they were very much caring about time reversal or discrete chiral symmetries, right. and when you can give fermions masses preserving those. Mm -hmm. um, and the answers are interesting. It's, it's, it's in groups of eight or 16, and there's special magic numbers that, 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 that turn up. Um, and it, and it, it, it's not gone unnoticed that the standard model has 16 fermions in one generation, if you include the right-handed neutrino, and, and whether there's something deep there or it's just numerology is not, not clear. Interesting, thanks. Other questions? All right, let, let me do the second example. Um, and the second example, it, you know, it, it's really the second most simplest as well, although it's, as you'll see, it takes a little bit of contortions, but it, it's not too bad. Um, and of course, it's, it's by far the most interesting. This is the standard model. Uh, I've listed here one generation of fermions. I, I didn't include the right-handed neutrino because it's neutral under everything. So you just give it a Majorana mass and that, that decouples straight away. Um, and the question is, how do you introduce new degrees of freedom, similar to what I just did, that give everything a mass, but without breaking G? That, that's the question. Um, just one comment, I've written everything as right-handed. So what you would think of as left-handed, I've conjugated so that they're actually also right-handed. That if, if, you, if like me, you can't remember hypercharge signs, um, that shows up, shows up because this is in the three bar rather than the three. So everything here is a right-handed uh, uh, vial fermion. All right, so um, they're the massless fermions. Now we've got to add, add some extra massive stuff. And this time, in contrast to the previous example, I do have to add fermions that are charged under G, the standard model. And so here they are. And, and now people were, were querying in the last example. Now, now I really need to be careful. If I add fermions charged under G, they have to come in uh, conjugate pairs. So um, I add three pairs with quantum numbers under G. And you can see that um, they come in conjugate pairs. There's a minus and a plus here. There's a three and a three bar here. And a, again, a, a plus and a minus. So for these red fermions, there's no problem at all writing down a bare mass term, just decoupling them to, to start with. And, and um, I actually have to add two pairs of neutral fermions, which I've, I've called neutrinos um, for obvious reasons. OK, so th this is our initial starting point, massless fermions, and now some extra massive fermions as well. And um, the purpose of introducing these extra pairs is that it adds an, another symmetry to this collection of fermions. In addition to the, the standard model symmetry, SU3 times SU2 times U1, there is also now an extra SU2 symmetry. You see that the top two lines, everything transforms in the same representation. So what I've put in a green box, um, 
uh, you can make transform under a new SU2 symmetry, which I will gauge. Turns out it's, um, uh, uh, it, it's not anomalous. More importantly, it doesn't have a mixed anomaly between H and this hypercharge. In other words, if I gauge H, uh, the standard model gauge group remains. That was important because this is all about not breaking G, the standard model gauge group. All right, so um, initially, of course, the reds are heavy, the, the blacks are, are, are massless. Uh, so it's not an exact symmetry. That means, again, that this H SU2 gauge field is, uh, uh, is higgs to begin with. So there's some extra scalars in the game to make sure it higgs. But, but now I play the same game as I did before. I, I bring down um, the masses of these H gauge bosons, these SU2 gauge bosons, together with the masses of the red fermions. I allow everything to interact together. And let's see what happens. So um, what does happen? Well, nothing good, sadly. Let, let, let me explain why. Um, from, the purpose, from the perspective of this SU2 gauge theory, it's SU2 coupled to six vial fermions. It's six because there's two in this box, and there's three in this box, and there's one in this box. That means that that H gauge theory has an SU6 global symmetry. And it's not hard to see that the standard model uh, group G is a subgroup of that SU6 global symmetry, just because these things are transforming under, under G. In, in fact, the way it's embedded in SU6 is the obvious way. You embed it in SU5 as you would in a gut, and then that SU5 just sits in the bottom five by five right-hand block of a, of a six by six matrix. So there's nothing, nothing difficult about this. What happens? This SU2 gauge theory will confine. Um, th this time we know it confines because we can do lattice simulations of this theory. We, we couldn't have the last one because it was a chiral theory and you can't simulate chiral theories on a lattice. This one isn't chiral. Um, we know exactly what happens. The SU2 confines, but when it confines, it spontaneously breaks this SU6 flavor symmetry, breaks it down to SP3 for, for what it's worth. In breaking the SU6, it also breaks the standard model gauge group G, and then it's game over. We're not allowed to spontaneously break symmetries uh, that we want to preserve. So this does not do the job. But Antonio be beat me to it. Um, there's an easy way to fix this up. And the easy way uh, is to super symmetrize everything that's on the, the, the slide here. That means we add extra scalars um, for uh, all of these fermions that have the same quantum numbers as those fermions. Uh, they're charged under G, but they're just scalars, so there's no problem giving them a mass without breaking G. And in addition, I add one extra fermion that is not charged under G, but is a, a gay geno for, for H. The reason for this supersymmetrization is not because, you know, I'm desperately in love with supersymmetry, although I am teaching it uh, this, this year, so uh, it, may, it may grow on me. Um, it, it's because um, uh, this theory is now among the class of theories that Cyborg told us how to solve in the 1990s. David, before you go on, can I ask yeah. a question? So you see, you only added the gay geno. Are you? Uh, do, did you have Higgses that were gay, that were uh, originally giving this SU two gauge bosons mass? Do they are they also super symmetrized those Higgses? I, I could, although it, it's not strictly speaking necessary. Um, you know, I need the endpoint of the strong coupling to do what I want to do. I didn't need supersymmetry when these things were heavy, if you see what I mean. So, um, okay. yeah, they're, they're also flo floating around, and I, I have. Brushed, sweep, swept them under the rug a little bit, but they're, they're not necessary to be super symmetrized. Um, certainly by the time I get to this point, Cliff, I've just assumed all of those extra scalar, all those Higgs scalars are heavy. They've just decoupled from the dynamics rather than being condensed. Um, so what do I have? I have an SU2 supersymmetric theory coupled to six doublets. The supersymmetric version of this theory is uh, an example of a theory that Cyberg told us undergoes confinement without chiral symmetry breaking. In the SUSY literature, it's known as S confinement. And so, so what happened? So everything in a green box was uh, charged under this SU2 gauge group. And the confinement binds things together into mesons. And um, when you weren't looking, I gave names to all of these objects. So th these capital letters, you should think of as the names of superfields. And the ones in the green box is L, D, and N. And this SU2 gauge group confines things, but because there's some anti-symmetry going around, it confines it into 15 mesons. It's 15 because it's six times five divided by two because of that, 
an anti-symmetry. So, so here are the 15 mesons that come out of the green box, 15 massless mesons uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and when I say mesons, you should think they're actually fermionic because this is a supersymmetric theory. So they have both scalar and fermionic parts. All right, so there's two L's, for example, and there's two D's and there's an L and a D, and it's just any two pairs you can put together. You, you know, whenever you, you do a project, there's always one point in the project where you, you sort of step back and think, oh, that's really pretty. This is the point where I thought that this is really pretty. Um, the following fact is, is, is quite lovely. You calculate the quantum numbers of these 15 mesons. Meanwhile, there were 15 objects that were just a bystander to this SU2 gauge dynamics. Th these are the objects that aren't in a green box. See, there's 15 because there's two and there's six plus one plus three plus, plus three. And you calculate the quantum numbers of these 15 mesons and they turn out to be exactly conjugate to the quantum numbers of uh, the, the 15 guys that were just left as bystanders. In other words, this dynamics has done what we wanted it to do. It took the chiral spectrum of the standard model bound some of those fermions together and left us with uh, a vector-like spectrum under G. So what, what does it mean? It, it means that um, if I write down a super potential term now, so now I need Yukawa couplings, not, not four fermion terms, write down a super potential term of the following kind. Uh, this super potential term, what it does is bind two things or it couple together two things from a green box with one thing that isn't. So for example, there's an LLE, and you can see that if you form a bound state of uh, LLE, it has the quantum numbers uh, 1, 1, minus 6. So you can put it together with this, and this is a G singlet. So, so everything here is a singlet under G. You flow to the infrared, that SU2 gauge dynamics kicks in, the stuff in the green box, and all of these pairs in the infrared are now described by a single composite field. Um, this pair is described by a field E tilde. The DD is described by a field U tilde, and so on. In other words, these Yukawa terms in, in the UV um, uh, rearrange themselves under strong coupling dynamics and they just become mass terms for the fermions, but they're mass terms that do not break the symmetry group of the standard model, and in particular don't break electroweak symmetry. So th this is the mechanism of how you add extra degrees of freedom to gap one generation of the standard model um, without breaking uh, uh, the gauge group G. Um, notice that the mass scale is set by the confining scale of this H equals SU2 gauge dynamics, multiplied by some dimensionless Yukawa terms, which, which I, I haven't put in. So there's actually five independent masses that, um, that, that one can have. In particular, it means that you can give a mass to um, one generation of the standard model that, that's arbitrarily high. It can be parametrically higher than the TEV scale, um, which isn't possible through the Higgs mechanism because you would need Yukawa couplings much bigger than one to give masses uh, bigger than the Higgs bed uh, to these fermions. All right, um, a quick comment. Uh, supersymmetry was useful because I know how to solve Susie theories. Cyborg knows how to solve Susie theories. Um, it, you can show it's not necessary. This whole construction survives the soft breaking of supersymmetry. Um, so you don't need exact Susie to make this work, but somewhere in the neighborhood of the supersymmetric point, um, this whole mechanism uh, still flies. Cl Cliff, you, you have a question. I was uh, waffling about whether to ask it. You said that the, in, in your construction, the things you added included uh, singlet, singlet neutrinos. Uh, and I guess um, from your point of view, those are just things you're adding and you're adding, you get to add whatever you want uh, amongst the red fields. But uh, should I be thinking of this as saying that, that if I wanted to give a mass to the standard, you know, the real standard model particles in this way, I could not do so without having singlet neutrinos? You know, it, it's like I've just set these questions up one after the other. Um, I'll, um, I don't know I'll, this man. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll talk about some, some motivations next, okay. and, and we'll get to a, a question that's similar to that. Send us um, a payment, please. <laughs> and any other any other questions, planted or not? All right, so. I, I think this is quite cute. I, this is, I didn't know this was possible before, before we sort of played, started playing with this last year. Um, it is possible to give masses to chiral fermions preserving a chiral symmetry. You need extra degrees of freedom to do it, but when they interact, it's, it's very possible. And, and so the, the obvious question is, what, what is it good for? Why, why would we care about this? Um, which is partly, at least the second point here is partly related to Cliff's question. So I, I have three minutes and I will, um, 
quickly try to, to go through this. So, so in fact, my motivation for this, this whole problem was uh, very much coming from uh, the nielsen Nimir theorem and the problem of fermion doubling in the lattice, um, which is again, a problem that, that really resonates with things that people in condensed matter physics are, are doing in the story of, of interacting topological insulators. So, um, this graph is actually a proof of the nielsen Nimir theorem, but I'm not gonna walk you through it. Um, you try to put chiral fermions on the lattice, uh, the lattice rebels, the lattice doesn't like it, and it hands back to you um, double of fermions of the opposite chirality, which is uh, um, uh, an enormous obstacle towards progress in understanding chiral gauge theorems. It, it's also rather strikingly a mathematical theorem that tells us we're not living in the matrix. Uh, the nielsen Nimir theorem says you cannot simulate chiral gauge theories on a computer, not us or any advanced civilization. So we can't possibly be living in, in the matrix. Um, like all no-go theorems in physics, it uh, comes with assumptions. Um, I think anybody who's thought about this believes it should be possible to put chiral gauge theories on the lattice, just no one knows how to do it. And one assumption in the nielsen Nimir theorem is, is actually that it relies on weak coupling physics. It does not apply when you have a strongly interacting quantum field theory. And so there was an old idea uh, by Eichton and Preskill that maybe one could introduce some strong interactions um, among the fermions at the edge of the Brillouin zone, the doublers, which give them a mass without breaking the chiral symmetry G, which is say the standard model gauge. group. So it's a very familiar problem in the, in the context of this talk. Um, what they did, however, was give it, try to give it these fermions a mass with the following term, which is very irrelevant term. Uh, they had to write down four fermion terms because they were the only things invariant under G. Mass terms don't do it. And then they had to write down some extra derivatives because they wanted these interactions to kick in at the edge of the Brillouin zone, not at, not at the origin. Um, you, you know, for me, this, this, this whole idea is anathema, but for you guys, effective field theory, colloquium, seminar people, this should be the worst thing. You can't gap fermions with irrelevant terms. That's, that's not the way it works. Um, but, but what they did was they weren't working in the context of effective field theory. That they wanted this term to be strong coupled, strongly coupled at the lattice scale, um, where you just throw away all intuition that you get from Wilsonian uh, RG point of view. It's not really a field theory at the lattice scale, it's just a bunch of interacting uh, quantum mechanical degrees of freedom. Um, and, and after 40 years of trying, it turns out it just doesn't work. I, I, I'm running out of time. I have a feeling the reason it doesn't work is because they weren't thinking in the continuum limit. For reasons I can explain later. So, so what I really wanted to do was, was try to kick up a, a continuum model that could do the job that Eichton and Preskill wanted to do. And, and as you've seen, that, that's exactly what we succeeded in doing. Um, of course, that still begs the question, can we now take these kind of continuum gapping mechanisms that we have and put them on the lattice and use them to solve the fermion doubling problem? Um, you know, I, I gave you two examples. One was a chiral theory that was supposed to confine without chiral symmetry breaking. You, you can't put that on the lattice. That, that's kind of, you know, that just elephants and turtles or whatever it is, you know, that, that, that's just too, you can't solve a, putting a chiral theory on a lattice by putting a chiral theory on a lattice, that doesn't work. But then the second one was a, a non-chiral supersymmetric theory. In principle, there's no difficulty at all in, in, in putting that on the lattice and doing what you want to do. I don't see an obstacle. Um, except it's very clear that if you were trying to simulate this, there's a very serious sign problem uh, to overcome. Um, so I, I think if I, if I wanted a, a slightly gutsy punchline for this, I would say there is no fermion doubling problem, there's only a sign problem. Um, I'm running out of time, so let, let, me, uh, let me just, just uh, leave it there. You can ask me questions. But, but then it, it sort of strikes me as cool that um, you can give masses to, to one generation of the standard model without breaking electroweak symmetry. So is it good for anything? Which is sort of Cliff's question. You know, you had to add those extra right-handed neutrinos, but should I be thinking of these as somehow real particles of, 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 real, of real interest? So I don't know the answer to this. Um, and it's not for want of thinking for the last, the last year. An obvious thing I've already said, you can use this to give a mass to a fourth generation with arbitrarily large uh, masses. I don't know why you might want to do that, but if you did, um, you could. Uh, th this was named generation flow actually in this, this recent paper by, uh, by the Irvine group. Um, 
relatedly, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is good news or bad news, but, but when you do string compactifications to try and get the standard model, um, in many of them, you get extra exotic chiral matter that isn't seen. Uh, and because it's chiral, uh, it was always thought it was impossible to give it a mass, leaving behind just the standard model fermion. So typically these, these um, string compactifications were just discarded. Um, but well, it should be possible to give it a mass. And in fact, this paper in certain heterotic compactifications um, shows exactly how to do it in the, in the stringy context. To be honest, I'm not sure we need more string compactifications. It would be nice to kill a few, but, but it, it does open up more, more possibilities. Um, what, one thing that I found particularly intriguing is there's something in the phenomenology literature called trinification. So it, it's not quite unification, but the idea is that the UV gauge group is SU3 color times two other SU3s. Uh, it's an idea that goes back to... Um, Actually, I haven't managed to track down either of these papers. They're both published in conference proceedings that, um, uh, well, I couldn't get hold of them because the library was closed, but maybe, maybe I should try again now. Um, uh, the idea being that you then introduce some scalar field, uh, which subsequently breaks the two SU3s that aren't color um, to two SU2s and two U1s. It, it turns out that the, the extra fermion content and that extra H equals SU2 gauge field that I needed is precisely the fermion content that sits within these trinification models. So, so somehow this trinification idea and the way to gap fermions without breaking the standard model gauge group uh, are the same theory, ju just in slightly different regimes of parameter space. Um, I, I don't know what to make of that, that observation, but it, it strikes me as cute. And as I was giving a talk to more phenomenologists than I usually give talks to, I, I thought I'd share it with you. All right, um, I'll, I'll finish there. Very happy to take any questions you may have. But